Bernstein. First of all, I don't like to think of myself as famous for anything. <laughs> Ridiculous. I mean, no, I, I just have a weird relationship with the word activist because honestly, like, I have friends who are activists in New York who call themselves activists who I refer to as activists. And like, look, at the end of the day, like, the labels of what we do, I don't think it is the most important thing at all. Like, call me whatever you want. Well, <laughs> but, but, you know, they're, they're organizing protests and fundraisers and doing community organizing. And like, look, I don't mean to diminish, like, I think there's value in what I do and I'm grateful to be able to do it. But like, I don't take myself that, I don't think, I, I don't think I've earned that title. And, and for what it's worth also, like, I think activism can be like gritty and I think that I get a lot of praise and have a lot of privilege in what I do and what a lot of people who consider themselves activists do like is pretty thankless. And you know, I think I receive like all the love and all the everything and I'm just posting on the internet, you guys. Like it's, it's not that serious. <laughs> well, yeah, but we, we, we love what you do on the internet. So. Yeah. Um, you're doing great. <laughs> um, so when you do like uh, your content, mostly like your political content, I feel like it's always very, very well like researched and stuff. Oh my God, What's those your... are some old pictures. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chris was taking I, out the, the old pictures. I do not take pictures of my abdomen like that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> For good reason. <laughs> Chris, what have you done? <laughs> um, so when you do this like political content that is very well researched, what's your like routine to to do political content? Or content I mean, in general? yeah, this is part of the reason why it's weird to like speak in front of people because like I am in my living room on my computer for like twelve hours a day, like that's it. Um, but no, I mean like, <clears throat> look, the internet is you know overflowing with people's opinions, and I'm ultimately just like adding to the cac cacophony of that. Mm -hmm. But I think, especially as like my reach has grown, there's a certain responsibility and like, okay, well if you're gonna like run your mouth, like be accurate and, um, and be thorough. And so like, I, that was a good set of nails. <laughs> I, I, I try to, I, you know, I post like less now, if you can imagine. I post less now, um, but I try to make everything that I post like really intentional and really thorough. And something I learned, frankly, the hard way is that you don't have to lend your voice to every single conversation ever that's happening. Like, I don't know. I've, I've always gotten a lot of messages from people when anything is happening anywhere to be like, hey, you have to talk about this right now. And believe me, like there are a lot of things where at a certain point it does become like, okay, yeah, you really should talk about this. However, if I were to always lend my voice, my uneducated voice to like everything that people in my inbox ask me to talk about, then like that would be my full-time job. And also I would never know what I was talking about. So I like to be really intentional about it. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, that doesn't mean I still don't run my mouth sometimes in ways that I, like, I shouldn't and regret immediately after, but like that's what Twitter is for. <laughs> <laughs> 
at three in the morning. <laughs> Okay, and so um, you said that you get a lot of messages and people want to like uh, want you to talk about a lot of stuff. Um, what other challenges are there when you do like political content? Um, yeah, like what's the challenges that you face? Uh, none. Everyone is so nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean like look. Anytime you put your opinions out there, like, people are gonna be dicks. And then people are gonna be dicks even more so when you're, like, visibly a faggot. Like, I don't know what I can say and what I can't what? say. But, like, <laughs> you know, you get the homophobic stuff, you get the infighting from, like, other queer people. Um, it's. It's like, there's like a, it, the internet is a cesspool and you don't need someone with like a bunch of followers on Instagram to tell you that. Like, the internet is a cesspool for all of us. Again, if you've been on Twitter, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But like, at the end of the day, like, I do what I do on the internet because I think it's, like, it, it's fun for me. Like, I genuinely enjoy it. I've always said that like, and I've reached points many times throughout the last bunch of years that I've done this that like, there was a point where I wasn't having fun anymore, or it wasn't like creatively fulfilling, that I would just not do it. Like, I, yeah, it's it's a really like emotionally and psychologically intense thing to like perform your beliefs for a million plus people, um, which is why I also like I don't really like to think about how many people are seeing things, which is also, by the way. Why, again, stuff like this is so weird, because there's like maybe 200 people in this room right now, and I, this might sound ridiculous, and I know I'm extraordinarily privileged in this, but like there's 200 people in this room right now, and like that is the amount of people who see my Instagram story in like 25 seconds, the first 25 seconds that it's up. And so if I were to imagine the people who see it in a full day sitting in front of me, you know, like, I would, I would not be able to handle that at all. So I just don't think about it. <laughs> That's where that was going. That's a great, great coping mechanism. <laughs> just not think about it. Do you like also doing, like, this kind of work in front of people? Yeah, of course. I mean, this is so much more personal. Yeah, right. Even though I'm speaking in a microphone and you're, like, looking at me. <laughs> but I, it feels personal. I don't know. We'll all talk afterwards, so. <laughs> no, I do. Um, so, one thing I was wondering was if you, like, could go back to when you started doing this content, would you, like, change anything or would you do anything differently, knowing that you're going to blow up like that? Um, no. No? Because, look, like, I cringe at everything. Like, I cringe <laughs> at, like, everything that I posted more than six months ago, I'm like, oh. <laughs> why did you say it like that? Like, why did you do it like that? But, like, part of the problem with the internet is that it's so permanent. Um, but, like, that is just what it is, and it's something that I've tried to, like, uh, that I've learned to relish in, really. Because you're always gonna, when, you, when you're immortalizing not just like pictures of yourself, but like your ideas and opinions, which like my ideas and opinions when I was 19 were not fully formed. I'm embarrassed by a lot of them because I think that I've learned a lot in the years since I was 19 years old. Um, and at the same time, when I'm 30, I'm 25 now, when I'm 30, I'm probably gonna look back at the things that I'm posting right now and be like, oh God oh, damn it. But, <laughs> Like, that's growth. And so I look back and I cringe, but it's like cringe with love. You know what I mean? And I encourage everyone to cringe at themselves, especially like, I spent so much time on the internet caring about if other people thought that I was like cringe. I know I keep using that word, but like that's <laughs> such a special word. Um, I, I spent so much time caring if people thought I was cringe, if, and it's like, whatever. Like, cringe is like, 
caring, at some, caring about something at a certain point in time and expressing that you care about that thing, whether it's like singing or dancing or doing politics on the internet, like, <laughs> it, just like commit to the bit. And like, you grow and you change and you look back and you're like, man, I would have done that. Like, of course I would have said things differently, but also like, I don't know, how would I be here if I hadn't like done a bunch of cringeworthy shit, <laughs> you know? I don't know. That's true. I love that. <laughs> we should all cringe at ourselves. We should all cringe at ourselves. You guys know yes. that meme, it's a cow. I don't know what the image has to do with this, but it's a cow, it's a cow like in the shallow part of the ocean just looking off into the distance. And then it says, to be cringe is to be free. And I think about that image all the time. I'm the cow. <laughs> okay, stunning. Um, great. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, I don't know how much you know about Checkpoint, but it's like this health organization. Um, so I would like to talk to you about, to talk about um, like the connection of um, fighting against stigma um, around sexual health and in like connection with online mm -hmm. content creating or activism, whatever you want to call it. Like, um, how important do you think this like online work is in this fight against stigma around I mean, like sexual health? It's so important. I mean, I don't know what sex education is like here, but like in the US, <laughs> I don't, I mean, was it, is it good or bad? Like, we don't bad? know it. <laughs> okay, well like, I mean in the US it depends which part of the US you're in, um, but a lot of it is just like really bad if it exists at all and it's like super informed by like Christianity and like just like don't have sex, good luck. Um, but... <laughs> Saying this to a room full of queers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so I never did. This is a good Christian woman. No, I mean, it's so funny that, like, as a side note, it's so funny when, like, I don't know, like, I take prep, and I've taken prep since I turned 18, before I had sex for the first time, because it, like, came out kind of onto the market in the US, and I was going to college, and I, like, told my mom about it, and I was like, I want to get prep. And I explained to her what it was. And she was like, okay, well, we have to go to my pediatrician. <laughs> so I was explaining to my pediatrician, like, you know, like, I'm going to have anal sex. <laughs> but it was so interesting because she, my doctor, like, didn't know what prep was. And I had to explain it to her. And it was, uh, I, I remember telling her, telling my doctor, I was like, well, first of all, like before we get into this conversation, I need to ask you for this drug. Like, just so you know, like, I'm gay. And like, I came out when I was 15. I had been out for like three years at this point. Like, I was fine. And she like took my hand and she was like, okay, I just want you to know that I support you. And I was like, <laughs> and I was like, thank you. But I really just need a prescription. <laughs> Um, I love that you went to your pediatrician. Yeah, <laughs> I know. But, yeah, but like, I mean, I only learned about PrEP like through Instagram, you know? And I, frankly, I only really learned about AIDS through Instagram. Like the history of AIDS and the AIDS crisis, like, I'm assuming it's not taught here. It's definitely not taught in the US. And it's weird because like, I took AP US history, which like in the US is like the most rigorous history course that you could take uh, in high school. And we talk about like polio, and we talk about smallpox, and we talk about yellow fever, and we talk about like malaria, and all of these things. And AIDS, which is like the most recent of all of them, and the most, I would argue to people alive now, like culturally significant. And we just like never learned about the AIDS crisis. And the first thing that I saw about the AIDS crisis, like the only thing we learned about HIV or AIDS was what the acronym stood for. Um, which like, oh, oh thanks. What do I do with that information? 
Hey, we don't even learn that. Did anyone? I do. It's like we spent like a, we spent like a week talking about oral herpes, and then when it came to HIV, they were like human immunodeficiency virus. Anyway, let's talk about the common cold. Like it's like God, fuck. Um, but so like, I I'm not rambling for no reason. I'm, well, like, but you know, uh, this is all to say like I ended up learning about like the history of HIV and AIDS through Instagram. And then I became obsessed with it because I was like, how has nobody ever taught me this history, ever? Like, why does it not show up anywhere? Um, and we all know why that is, but when I was 18, I didn't. And so I just started like researching obsessively. And that's part of why now that I have this like kind of educational, kind of funny, kind of cultural, kind of political platform myself, I use it a lot to talk about AIDS history um, because, like, I don't know, I want to be for some teenager what, like, whatever Instagram account that I founded on was for me. Um, and I know that's a lot about history and stuff, but, yeah, I mean, even, like, U equals U, you know, undetectable equals trans untransmittable, like, that's also something that I learned about on social media. It's weird how they expect us to just figure it out. When you're straight, I mean, you learn about contraception, you learn about all these things, and when you're gay, they're just like, we would rather not talk about it, so good luck. And like, I don't know, I only learned about, like, before I had sex for the first time, oh my god, didn't think I was gonna talk about this. got really quiet. <laughs> but like, before I had sex the first time, we didn't talk about anal sex in sex ed. We talked about vaginal sex. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how to prepare. I didn't know what it would feel like. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know like how to make it more comfortable. And so I was like, the first, oh my god, yeah. <laughs> the Game Boy thing, that's fun. Um, I read an article on, uh, in Cosmo, you know Cosmo? It's like a, like a women's yeah. sex magazine. We know it here. Uh, Cosmopolitan. Cosmopolitan. It's like ah. a big women's sex magazine in the U.S. I read an article about like what you should prepare for for anal sex, but it was written for straight women who it's like want to spice up your sex life with your boyfriend. And I was like, this is my only option, guys. So <laughs> this is all to say, I think it's important. <laughs> I think I mean, sex ed in Switzerland is, I think sex ed everywhere is not really like focused on queer topics in general. Yeah. Cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Stop. Yeah. So, um, so um, I feel like the, like the newer generation has lost the, the fear of HIV and AIDS right. quite a lot, which I mean, for good reasons, we have medication and stuff now. Yeah. Um, and so, how can we do like political content activism, whatever, mm -hmm. um, without bringing this fear back? What would you say, like? I mean, look. Ultimately, like, my expertise is in communication, not necessarily public health. Yeah. And so, I don't want to give like an ultimatum on like how we do this. Okay. But. I mean, honestly, I think, like, sometimes I see discourse online about how, like, for example, about how, like, we've normalized getting uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea, and, like, we've, like, made these things too casual. Like, I don't think there is a such thing. Um, and it's interesting too, because sometimes I'll have like my straight girlfriends will be like, I think I got, I'm like, what? It's Tuesday, you know? <laughs> you, got, you got chlamydia, like what, you know, whatever. But, but I think that's such a testament. <laughs> I respect that they got chlamydia, but you know, it's just like not that big of a deal. But I think like, honestly, <laughs> I, <laughs> You're funny. <laughs> oh. 
I mean, um, thanks. <laughs> no, I mean, I think like, I, we, we have to like make this stuff not a big deal. Yeah. Like that's what I think. Um, and so when we, I mean, when we talk about HIV now, it's like literally, it's like we can't have our dad's HIV education because it meant something way different 40 years ago than it does now. I have friends living with HIV and you know, and, and you probably do too. You would never know unless they told you because they live full, healthy, productive lives. Um, you know, obviously when, when properly managed. And so it's like, I think what we have to do, and you know, when I talk about HIV and AIDS, I, I, like I said, I usually do it from the historical perspective because I'm, like I said, like I'm not a public health expert. I do more of like history and politics. But, um, you know, Obviously, sexual health is a big deal, but you can't convince people to care about it by scaring them. You know, it's, I mean, it's like the same thing with like, well, the best, the best way to not get an STI. I remember learning this in sexual health, in, in like health class, they said, the best way to not get an STI is to not have sex. And I was like, okay, well, like, I don't know, the best way to not get in a skiing accident is like stay in your house. Like, what the fuck kind of advice is that? <laughs> And so I think it's just always about being as pragmatic and realistic as possible. People are going out, people are having sex. Um, you know, talk about prep, talk about you equals you. Like I, again, I have friends who are HIV positive and the thing that they talk, you know, as far as discrimination and stigma goes, the thing that they talk to me the most about, which I'm not the most qualified to speak on myself, but is like, discrimination from other gay men on apps like Grindr for having a positive status on there, even if it's undetectable. Mm -hmm. People going out of their way to be cruel. And I think that's, it's a failure of human kindness, but it's also a failure of education. Um, and so, yeah, just like, don't shut up. Keep, keep yelling from the hills. You equals you. Yeah. Yes. Um, so you said that you have learned a lot in the past years, and like, I, I, I think it's all political topics and stuff. Like, who are your resources? Who, oh, I hate this word, inspires your like content? Do you have any like? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean. Communities. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, like, one of, honestly, one of my biggest inspirations on the internet, which, like, I was gonna say, if you follow me, you might like her, but also, like, if you don't like me, you might like her. Um, I don't know if any of you know Natalie Wynn ContraPoints on YouTube. She makes, I, I, I have her on my podcast, which is crazy, because I look up to her so much, but, like, she's, um, she's a, a trans woman who makes these, like, feature-length film <laughs> length YouTube videos about like gender and capitalism and philosophy, but also like, so I don't know. It's, I have a lot of like imposter syndrome about what I do. Cause like, I see what other people are doing on the internet and on their podcasts and YouTube videos. And I'm just like, wow, they're so much smarter than me. I'm such a fake, you know? But I don't say that because I'm fishing for comments, like it's fine, but it's, it's weird. Um, that being said, I do think it's like a good strategy to always surround yourself with people who make you feel kind of dumb. Because <laughs> then you're always gonna learn a lot. Um, and I look up a lot to the people who, uh, who have come before me. Um, I'm fortunate to have friends now who are, you know, of my parents' generation who were in ACT UP. And I'm really grateful that like, having this platform online has made it so that I can connect with some of them. Um, Peter Staley, who is, I don't know, in his 50s, and is a New York AIDS activist, um, and has been since the 80s. He was like 25 and working at a bank in New York when and closeted. 
um, when he was diagnosed with AIDS then? Because you weren't really diagnosed with HIV at the very beginning. You were just like, waited until you had symptoms, then you went in and they were like, you have AIDS. Mm -hmm. And so he was in his mid-20s, he went, because uh, he had symptoms, he went to get tested and he had AIDS. And it was the mid to late 80s, like he fully thought he was just gonna die. And he was just basically waiting for it to happen. And so he like quit his job, he quit his job as a, as like a stock trader and joined ACT UP, which you all know ACT UP. Um, it's like a big AIDS activism group. And, um, and he ended up being one of the few people in that group and among his friends who lived until 1996 when antiretroviral medications came about. And so he, he's still alive today. Um, but, you know, he obviously was HIV positive and lived through like the peak of the crisis, and never thought he would live again. Like, has such an unbelievable wealth of knowledge and a perspective that I am so grateful uh, to not have and to not have to have because of, because, you know, I stand on the shoulders of people like him. And so anyway, he lives in New York and we got lunch a few times. And <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I love learning from elders. Sorry, I feel like I give such long-winded answers to everything. I'm sorry. Okay. I, just, I also think it's so sad that we lost, like, a whole generation yeah. of people that we could look up to. Um, like I think it's probably the same in New York as it is in here. We, we don't really have these clear elders to look up to um, because we can be this generation. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like if I'm gonna have a million and a half followers on Instagram, like why am I not going to share these people's stories? the few of them that are left to tell them, like, no, let's get this out. Like, the baby gays have to know. <laughs> the baby gays who are quibbling over, like, whatever fucking TikTok, like, oh my god, I sound like such a boomer. <laughs> it's okay. But sometimes, sometimes, God, stop, because everyone here is, like, like not 14. I, no, I love, I love baby gays. I love seeing, like, a 13 year old who's like out and living. I'm like, yeah, that's the whole point. Like that is literally the whole point, so you can have that. However, I want everyone to know their history so we can have some perspective. So when we're arguing over like, whether or not Billie Eilish's music video is really gay, <laughs> it's, guys, what a blessing for this to be the thing we're arguing about, you know? <laughs> and when I say we, I'm not referring to myself because I don't care if Billie Eilish's music video is gay enough. <laughs> Try the way it is. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so you have been all of my questions that I wanted to ask you and that also Checkpoint asked me to ask you. Um, <laughs> no, because, like, these topics are really important. Um, before we get to the questions from the audience, um, is there anything that you would like to say about your work? whatever to the audience. Oh God, I mean, no, just that like, even like doing this is, I mean, again, it's like, it's weird because like I said, like, I, I don't know, I'm 25. I, I don't think of myself as like an authority on anything. I think that I maybe am good at using social media, but that's like kind of the extent of it. I think otherwise I just have a lot of ideas and opinions, like everyone in this room. And <laughs> sure, I have a big reach, but like, I think that we are all, like the, the most valuable connections, I think, and the, the best way to change minds is in person. And we all have groups of people in our own lives that we have an impact on. Um, and yeah, I mean, don't, like, I, I think there's so much to be said about the power that you can have at, like, your dinner table um, with your family or, or, I mean, your friends, if your friends don't agree with you. Your friends probably also are, like, <laughs> with it. Um, the sister and uncle. <laughs> right. This, we were, we, yeah, on Saturday we were talking about the archetype of, like, your, your, like, homophobic uncle. Like, we all have the power to affect change in our, in our own communities. 
and you don't need a ton of followers to do that. And um, I don't know if that's me just trying to take responsibility off of myself, but it's it is still the truth. So. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. So now it is your turn. Does anyone have a question? Four minutes. Test, test. Um, so, as probably a lot of people here know, you're like a very avid poster. So I wanted to know what's like, what's your opinion on like the leftist Twitter community? Because like I, I'm very much in that, but I, I don't see you interacting with that a lot, and I wonder like a lot if that's on purpose. Um. Well, I mean, I can't even say like which specific, I don't know, I feel like leftist Twitter has like a lot of subgroups as well. Um, I don't know, when it comes to the internet, I really, really just try to like do my own thing. Um, I do have like friends who are also creators, but uh, you know, as far as like, when I look at the left online and when I look at the queer community online even like, there's so much infighting, and I think that like it's valid in a sense. Like that's so annoying. Like calling something valid, like the most meaningless word in 2023. But <laughs> but like I don't know. I I would rather use my finite minutes on Earth to like engage with people I actually think are harmful to myself and like in fighting with other like left-wing people or other you know queer left-wing people is just not not something I want to do also it just like seems kind of miserable so I mean the <laughs> Twitter is all of Twitter is miserable <laughs> but I try to make it as the least miserable for myself as I can so <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question but I kind of just like to keep to myself as much as you can when you have like hundreds of thousands of people telling you what to do always but yeah. <laughs> I'm also intimidated by a lot of leftists. <laughs> hey, so um, I wait. I can't see. Where are you? Can you stand up? Stand Can up. You hear me? Oh my God. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So I'm not sure if I got it correctly because I wasn't so active on Instagram recently but you also took some actions in Congress, right, recently, like you went into lobbying in America? Oh, it? yeah, sometimes I go with with um, a progressive lobby group to, I don't know if any of you have ever done political lobbying, but it is like the most humiliating thing that you can do. Tell us more. <laughs> you literally, so like, <laughs> so every now and then I go to DC to um, lobby with this progressive political group called Courage for America, and you meet with a bunch of Congress people. And like ultimately what it amounts to is like making meetings with Congress people and then going to their offices and sitting at a table with them and being like, please, can I have rights? <laughs> like it's the most fucking humiliating, belittling thing you could do. And also like you have to do it. Um, and so like my heart goes out to everyone who like really does work in politics. Like ultimately I sit at home and type things and um, and I'm able to have a lot of fun doing that, but there's a lot of people whose full-time job is like going to politicians and asking them to be seen as human, and it's so demoralizing, and like my heart goes out to people who do that. <laughs> also, a lot of people sometimes on the internet ask me if I would like, if I'd be willing to like work in politics, um, and the answer is no, <laughs> because I just, I've sent too many nudes, you guys. <laughs> Interesting point is that the politicians of our like future will have like there will be new What did you say? Of their, if there's like going to be news of future politicians. Right. I mean, at, at some point, like the president will have sent news that will have been leaked, right? Yeah. Like that's the direction that we're heading in, right? I hope so. At least. <laughs> Are you gonna run for president? No. <laughs> Because even if it is acceptable to have nudes, I don't want everyone to see them. No. <laughs> wow. I think the people disagree. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, 
So I'm a trans man, and I really appreciate all the educational content that you put out about trans topics in particular, because I find it to be like really valuable resource I can pass on to other people. So I want to say thank you for that. And um, something that I think you do really well is actually advocating on behalf of a community that you're yourself not a part of. And I think that's something a lot of people are really scared to do for fear of maybe getting something wrong or using your voice where it's not welcome. And I just think you do such a good job of that. So can you talk a little bit about how you engage with those types of topics? Thanks. That means a lot, really. Um, and I even feel weird receiving that as a compliment because it's like, I don't know. I just don't like to be self-congratulatory about it. Like, it's just weird. It's weird. It's not weird of you to say that. It's just weird to be sitting here, honestly. But, um, no, I mean, like, look, I think ultimately, like, I post about politics and I post about things that I'm interested in. Um, and something that I'm really interested in is, like, the the way that people came, especially in the United States, right? Because I'm aware that that's like my perspective and my lens, but like LGBTQ rights in the United States came to mean gay marriage. Um, and clearly it's, that is a, if that's the, the barometer you're using for where LGBTQ rights are at, then you're gonna be wildly misinformed about how most of the attacks on LGBTQ rights, again, at least in the US, are on trans people. Um, and so, you know, I like to talk about that kind of uh, cognitive dissonance that a lot of people have, and then also, I think, the currently, I think that the way a lot of cisgender gay, bisexual, and lesbian people conduct themselves around trans issues is really embarrassing. Um, I think this whole, like, I don't know how online a lot of you are, and I also don't know how much this, like, specific angle has arrived here, but, like, this whole, like, LGB without the T, and, like, divorce the gays from the trans, they're separate and the issues are different, like, you're a fucking idiot, first of all. You don't, you don't know your history because everything that they're doing to trans people now, they did exactly the same way with gay people 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. They're coming for the children, they're grooming, they're recruiting in schools, whatever. It's all the same, right? It's all the same fight and this idea that we can like, that as a cis gay man, that I should be like, well, I have my marriage, and we have Pete Buttigieg, and we have whatever. <laughs> Love to Pete Buttigieg, by the way. Like, I met Chas, and he's really nice. Um, but it's an American gay politician. I don't know how much. He's American, he's whatever, anyway. <laughs> but like, I, I just think this idea that like, in theory, cisgender gay men have more rights than they used to, and therefore, I should be like, good luck, buddy. Like, that's ridiculous. Um, sorry, this is just turning into a rant. <laughs> but yeah, that's why. And you know, so many of my friends are trans, both online and not. Um, and I refuse to view our struggles as distinct, distinct from one another. So, yeah. Thanks. Switzerland, like, do people do that stuff here? Like the like anti-trans, pro-gay stuff. It's so exhausting. I find I like. Yeah. Yeah. I have more animosity towards transphobic gays than I do towards transphobic straights. Because I think like the level of idiocy and the level of cognitive dissonance is, and the level of frankly like cruelty is more. It's like made even more apparent by the fact that you're gay and don't care about anyone but yourself. Mm. Anyway, okay. hi. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm you. <laughs> I'm okay, here. Sorry. <laughs> I thought it was you. Yes. 
Um, my question is like, how do you balance uh, self-emancipation, but also um, struggles in the scene, like for example, um, uh, for example, like maximum drug abuse, and or like also the last um, of like not possible to create stable relationships or uh, other parts that are not on the happy side of the of the rainbow, but still like need to be addressed, but also respecting to self-emancipation, um, but how, how can you address these topics also? Yeah, that's a really good question and something that I think about a lot. Because something that I privately care about, like really deeply, I mean, I think we all do, but like something that I spend a lot of time like thinking about and reading about is, um, is, is substance abuse, specifically in the gay male community, specifically with meth, um, which is a big problem in New York and in the US in general. Um, but one that doesn't really go discussed, it's kind of like a problem that hides in the shadows. It's kind of complicated for me because with my platform being the size that it is, there are certain things that I don't put on the main stage, as it were, because I know that a lot of my following isn't queer. Like a lot of my following, and I'm really grateful that so much of my following is like, just demographically, statistically, like cisgender heterosexual people who want to learn more, or who are just like on the left side of the political spectrum, or like have a gay cousin and like wanna be supportive or something. And I'm like, I know, I'm really grateful for that, but at the same time, like, when I start talking about issues that we have within the community, sometimes I feel like I'm doing that in front of people who don't have the wherewithal to like read that in a way that is discerning and cautious and doesn't encourage them to like form stereotypes about our own community, if that makes sense. And so there are some conversations that I keep you know, with people in real life, um, with queer people that I know, where we talk about those things together. But yeah, it's it's one that I'm still navigating for sure. We have another question right there. <laughs> Hi. So first of all. I'm really excited that you're here, and thanks a lot for being here and for talking about what you do. Um, and the question I have is, like, what do you think about the tendency that I think is especially strong in America, in the U.S., um, of like LGBTQ issues becoming more and more in individualistic and like identity um, things instead of focusing on the material needs um, and connecting struggles. You mean like intersectionality? Yeah, and like just the more identity, individual aspect of like um, LGBTQ issues, focusing more on individual individuals being able to label themselves as what they want to label themselves instead of um, uh -huh. focusing more on material needs too and like the material struggles of LGBTQ people. Yeah, that's also like, I mean, it's it's something that strikes me as like very Gen Z. I keep saying that, like I'm Gen Z, like I'm fully, well, some would argue. I think I'm Gen Z, I'm Gen Z enough. But it's like, I, I see that a lot like online where it's a lot of like, what labels are valid and what pronouns are valid. like. You, as far as I'm concerned, like anyone can call themselves whatever they want, and like I will respect it because it does nothing in the way of my own happiness. Like I just don't care. Like you use neo pronouns, and if that's what you want, then I will use neo pronouns for you because I literally affects me none. Um, I, I I think what you're saying is like right. Um, I think that we should, st again, like, I'm not an activist. I'm, I'm, and this is what I mean when I'm not an activist. Because when it, when it comes to, like, addressing, like, what struggles should we be fighting for the most right now, like, I'm not, gonna, I'm not an authority on it. Um, 
but I do think it's important to like maintain a bigger picture. And um, that's what I try to do with my content. Like what I mentioned before, like the quibbles people get into, like there's also a, I think there can be a disconnect between what people argue about online and like what is happening in real life. And I try to stay on the real life side of things, if that makes sense. If that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> it does, does it? I think it does. Does anyone else have? We have some questions. Um, hi, I just wanted to ask about um, when you obviously share things that are political, um, and not all of them you know, can be and have to be palatable. I just always wonder when I see your posts um, that I always think like, you have a very large reach. Like, um, is there any shadow banning happening? Do you, with such a large audience, I often wonder like, is anybody gonna come from Mac? Is, is, <laughs> is anyone gonna come from yeah. Mac? Probably. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, like, I get, I get so much pushback every day, and I think at some point, like, talking about the haters is, like, kind of overwrought. It's like, yeah, we get it, whatever, like, and that's, took me a long time to realize, too, is, like, at some point you have to, unless someone sends you a hateful thing that is genuinely very funny, <laughs> to the point where you can, like, laugh about it, perhaps publicly, and make a joke, like, I was talking about on Thursday night, like, Sometimes people, or I'm sorry, Saturday night. <laughs> um, sometimes people will like send me hate stuff, but it'll be like super psychosexual. Like, I hate you and I'm really horny for you. Like, like sometimes it gets really weird and then you have to laugh, but like, generally I, I try to focus, like there's so many people who engage with my stuff, if not because they like it, but they're at least curious. And like, why not do it for those people? Why not focus on that than like the unreachables? Um, but I mean, there are so, so on the whole, I don't really, I don't really care. People are always gonna have something to say and, and it has, I'm a very sensitive person. I've always been a very sensitive person. And on the whole, like, I keep saying that on the whole. <laughs> not a great euphemism. But um, no, in terms of Insta like seeing like Instagram is actively limiting you. Oh, limiting about shadow banning. I mean, or being political. I don't know. A lot of people see my stuff, so I would be very hard pressed to say that I'm ever shadow banned. And maybe it would be a good thing if I were her. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I don't know. Sometimes I see people talk about shadow banning, and I kind of think it's like conspiratorial. You know, and like, I, I don't know, maybe you're, maybe people just didn't like your post or something, but, but there are other times where I think it's very real. I mean, like, we're seeing, I'm seeing a lot of questionable behavior algorithmically in the way of like discussions about Palestine right now, which is very concerning, um, which even like I struggle to talk about in front of a room because that is honestly like, I have spoken recently about that um, and the need to call for a permanent ceasefire, um, which I will continue to do, but, and it's much easier now to, but you know, like, that was one, for example, to maybe answer your question that like, I talk about a lot of gay stuff, I talk about like a lot of lefty American stuff, where the audience that I already have can reasonably expect that from me. This was sort of like, new for me and something that I knew that not everyone, that a large portion of people who followed me were going to be very unhappy with. Um, ultimately, you just have to like do what your gut tells you anyway. Um, but I still get nervous for sure sometimes. However, I am less nervous now, especially after the last two months than I have ever been because I'm like, the largest, scariest group of people imaginable can get angry with you and you will still survive, and you will still, you know, live to slay another day. So, uh, I care less than I ever have. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah.
Hello, hi. Um, I would love for you to give us a little bit more of an insight into uh, queer life in the US in general, or like what, what is going on, what is happening there, because I feel like from our point of view, it's a little bit of a shit show what's going on over there. Just, <laughs> just because I, I feel like the things we hear this side are super biased. Um, but what are the biggest fights that you guys are fighting right now? What, how is it to live there? What is happening? Oh my god. <laughs> it's so bad. It's literally so bad, guys. But basically, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna have to try to like package this tightly because we could talk about it for two hours. But like trans youth, trans children have become the battleground onto which both the left and the right have projected like their entire political ideology on, which is really bizarre because <coughs> trans people represent like one to two percent of the population. Um, and so, I mean, we're having, you know, we have um, presidential elections next year in the US. So either like Joe Biden's gonna win or Trump is gonna win. and. Either way, it's gonna be really bad. Uh, Two-party system, it's great. But it's weird because like, they're doing the presidential debates now and they're talking about trans kids. And I'm not saying trans kids aren't worth talking about. Love them. But, woohoo. But like, the average American person <laughs> is not affected by whether like the 25 <coughs> transgender children in Iowa get healthcare or not. But instead of talking about like minimum wage and the climate crisis and the shrinking middle class and job availability and inflation and all of this stuff that actually affects people every single day, all anyone wants to, wants to talk about is whether or not trans middle schoolers can play on the field hockey team for the gender that they were assigned at birth versus the one that they identify as. It's absurd. It is absurd, but like that is what American politicians are doing right now. They, I mean, I don't even need to like go into the transphobic rhetoric because it's just like not even worth reproducing in front of an audience, but it is so ridiculous. It is such a moral panic, this whole like, I don't know, are they doing the whole groomer thing here? Yeah, I think so. It's, it's, I mean, it, you guys know the gay agenda? Like, they're recruiting the kids. It's literally the 1970s gay agenda resurgence in the United States, this time with trans inclusion. <laughs> trans inclusive moral panic. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's been it's been a crazy uh, two years in the U.S. with just this. I mean, they're talking at the presidential de debates about how they're indoctrinating the children in schools. It's so it's so vintage. It's like <laughs> I literally feel like I'm living in the 1970s. Um, but it's back and it's worse because you know what? Now spearheading the movements are people like J.K. Rowling. Who are like, I mean, really, some of like the wealthiest, most influential entertainers in the world you have backing this shit. It's crazy. It's crazy. And you know what? Well, I know J.K. Rowling isn't Swiss, but she is European. And I'm, you guys have to take responsibility for her. Do something. We're trying. That's what's going on in a nutshell. I think it's not like love that bad in Switzerland yet. Yeah. Because of, I think on Saturday someone said we have like this two or three year lag in Switzerland. Before it reaches you, which I hope it doesn't. Right, because when we see something happening in the US, we know it's probably gonna come to us. But I heard that there have been protests against the drag queens here. Yes. There was a drag story Strap out there. Strap in, everybody. And uh, yes. like That's a where it young starts. neo nasty group. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's exactly what they started yeah. doing. It's crazy. Woo. It's crazy. It's crazy. You think that, like, by the way these people talk, you would think that 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 children were like 
drag queens to children are like clowns. Kids don't see drag queens and are, are like, what is what genitalia is under the dress? Kids like sparkles and glittery things and Whitney Houston. <laughs> Thank you for giving me a microphone so I can rant <laughs> out loud. Question. Question. The last question. Uh, you better make this one wow, what an honor. Um, first of all, as a Swiss American queer with a Jewish background, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for being visible. And thank you so much for being visibly you. Um, you too. Maybe to pivot. <laughs> thank you. Um, to pivot maybe to something a bit more hopeful. Um, you talked just about kind of the, the direction politics is in the US right yeah. now. We're seeing similar things in Switzerland. What is your beacon of hope in all of this shit show that we call reality? Um, just that like we're not going anywhere. I know that sounds so like we're not going anywhere, like like rallying cry, but we're we're literally not. And like again, I talked about this on Thursday, but like <laughs> Saturday. I talked about what this on Saturday. <laughs> they don't want me to talk about Catholic Thursday. <laughs> I'm kidding, I think on Thursday I was on a red eye. Anyway, um, no, I mean, like, these people want us to be miserable. Like, they want us, if not dead. They want us to hang our heads in shame, and they want us to be miserable, and they want us to be ashamed, and they want us to be embarrassed, and they want us to wish that we were straight, or wish, they want us to wish it all away, and like, we're not. We're here, we're celebrating it. Mm -hmm. We're not going anywhere. We're gonna keep indoctrinating the children. <laughs> and, <laughs> but see, now you're gonna post that, and I'm, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get on lips of TikTok again. <laughs> It's good. Put me on lips of TikTok again. <laughs> um, That's a goal. <laughs> no, but really, I mean, like, we live, uh, we live in such like vibrant community with one another, and this not, you know, hopefully not breaking our spirit, but as I've seen in the U.S. where I live, like, strengthening us making us come together and fight back harder because we don't really have an option. Like, that's what gives me hope. Thank you so much. Showing up. You're welcome. It was a great evening. And, and thank you for moderating.